welcome everybody back to the Pop One Podcast, episode two. It's me, Danny, joined with Alex today. And we've also got a super special guest for you guys today. It's Michael Murphy. You guys might know him as the co-talker player, the math mech player, the guy of a thousand lines. There's a whole lot of names that we know him by, but we just know him by Michael or Dumbass. Uh, Michael, you want to talk a little bit about yourself? Tell us uh, why you like the game, why you play it, why you enjoy hanging out with the likes of us, and uh, what keeps you motivated to keep playing the game? Well, clearly I'm a mascus and love to be called a dumbass, but, uh, but you know, other than that, <laughs> no, nah, really, uh, we, we played Yu-Gi-Oh! God, years ago, like everybody else, same story, just, you know, you kind of do it with your friends, and then, man, this is probably a few years back, right? pre-covid and uh and one of my buddies was like hey let's get some structure decks and you know dust it off i was like all right cool so you know you play a little bit and then uh then it, it hits you and then of course you're addicted like everyone and you got to have shiny cardboard but but yeah no we got back in um it's been a fun ride since then um so really now just get to the point of the game um got a ycs top so that, that i've got that i've got an old sjc top and then a, a bunch of regional stuff and you know all the kind of things like that but not any of the real, uh, really good, good competitive stuff. So yeah, now the goal is really just, just do good at the premier events and kind of get into that mindset where it, it's great to top, that's fun and all. But now, how do we crack into those top fours and, and try to get some wins? You know. Yeah, and um, I know we were really hyped when you got that YCS top. For those of, for those that don't know, because they're uh, newer players, you know, Michael and I, we probably have the longest history on the team of playing, especially like at bigger tournaments. I think Alex talked a little bit last week about, or the two weeks ago talking about he played before, but uh, Alex, you didn't go to YCSs or anything like that competitively. Did you, or am I wrong? Uh, not until this year. This is my first year. This is uh India is going to be my fourth premier event. Um, but yeah, this is my first year really being like super, super like competitive. Yeah. So Michael, for those back home, what's a JC? <laughs> So in SJC, it's the old Shonen Jump Championships for those of us that are pawpaws. But yeah, basically around the um, probably like 2009 to 2011, that's when I'd say I was like, quote unquote, decent at the game. But uh, yeah, I mean, things around then, we couldn't travel as much. Um, Life was just in a different place back then. But that was before um, I really enjoyed that time in the game because you would have some things like Pojo and things like that. For those of you that are old school and you remember it, but there wasn't any of the cookie cutter things that go on now. You couldn't go on YouTube and watch a combo tutorial. You couldn't go on there and just like copy somebody's deck list randomly. So there was a lot of creativity in deck building and a lot of, you know, just IRL playtesting that went on because back then dueling network was just getting started. So you had a little bit of an online platform, but really, I mean, it was, it was harder to master the game back then in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I, um, I'm sure you remember this time too, but getting the little price books that would tell you how much the cards were worth because you couldn't look them up. So nope. that was back in the good old days when you could get the, all the cards you needed for like a shiny dark magician because some kid really wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those were the days when trading was fun. <laughs> and now everyone uh, price gouges for you know ten cents, and they're looking in your binder for a ten cent card. But, uh, well, we're glad to have you on the podcast. I know um, last week we talked about getting some guests on, and honestly, we didn't expect you to have you so soon. You're always so busy, so we're, we're very thankful you were able to carve out a little bit of time. Um, last week, Alex and I talked a little bit about, about the state of the game, where we're at with it, and it seems to be that I've noticed a trend where a lot of people are getting more burnt out on Yu-Gi-Oh! lately. I've seen multiple Yu-Gi tubers now who are taking a step back, um, not only for making content, but for just playing the game in general. Does it feel like the game is starting to get to a stale point for you, or do you can you kind of see why people are taking a step back, or you just think it's the natural flow of things where eventually everybody's time in Yu-Gi-Oh and card games in general just runs its course? You can look at it a couple different ways. I mean, I think everything you said has merit there, but I think for just if we look past the last, gosh, I would probably say six to nine months of the game, it's great to get into the game and be a casual player. There are so many different strategies out there. They're very affordable. And honestly, I mean, with a little bit of luck and knowing what your strategy can do, you can top and even win some events um, by playing something that honestly might be table 500 in some cases. But then from a competitive perspective, it is very frustrating when you're playing a very, very wide format. And you can say all day that you're gonna do good in your early rounds and that at top tables, you're only gonna play X, Y, and Z. 
But, uh, but I mean, even myself recently, I've had so many events where, you know, I'm playing against the tier limits of the world, the unchained, and then I randomly run into a dark world or I run into a, I ran into a volcanic FTK the other day. So those are the things that as a competitive player, I see where people are getting more and more frustrated because they spend all this time, all this prep and all this money to go to big events. And then you end up, you know, getting hit by the one combo, wombo combo deck that FTKs you that you didn't prepare for. So totally see where people can get a little frustrated sometimes. It's yeah. almost like the locals <laughs> philosophy is seeping into these bigger events with these random decks. Well, I think it's potentially that, but also think about it this way. You've got people that, I mean, I'm joking with the Volcanic FTK, but I really did see this guy play and he knew his strategy very well. And at the end of the day, other people did it. So there's a surprise mm -hmm. factor in that. In big events, surprise factor only carries you so far. So, I mean, you have to be aware of that. But if you're somebody that's going with the idea of, hey, I just want to have fun and I want to top, well, damn, that guy did that. He had a good time. Yeah, and uh, now I'll play the devil's advocate here. If, you know, we quickly go to the Pop One Podcast YouTube channel, we can easily see that uh, your top 32 with a y at a YCS with what? With what? <laughs> Was with a deck that some people might consider, Michael, table 500. Like, let's be real. If I play against co-talkers and I look at the match slip and their name is not Michael Murphy, I'm just going to take a, take a nap while I win. So it's interesting that you say that, but you're actually one of the people who are doing that. You know, uh, you went into that YCS knowing that strategy and you did very well with it. It prevailed. So do you feel like you're being a little a little hypocritical with that oh probably a little bit but also there's a thing too that there's a difference between knowing a strategy well and just absolutely mastering it so as an example i i'm i'm a very competent player whatever deck you give me i can play it i'm not saying i'm going to play it perfect but i am going to say i'm going to play it to the ability that you know it's probably a little bit better than average however when i played futch um, at the last event and he was on branded he's one of the pioneers of, of branded and all that it can do and his ability to do things with the deck that I didn't even think of. It was just like, man, it was like, I felt like I was playing against the damn waterfall and it was coming at me. Um, it was very impressive. And that's the level of mastery I feel you need on a strategy to be able to compete at that level. So when I'm thinking about deck building, if I'm going to play something that is a surprise type strategy, I want to make sure that I master it really, really well to that point to where if I'm going to play a player of that level that's arguably better than me, then again, I want to be able to compete. Because in a lot of cases, I've watched a lot of videos lately post Agog, and um, Jesse Cotton just a great example of that. He plays the strategy so well that a lot of times his gameplay can actually carry him to a win, even if his hand is a little bit weaker than his opponent. So I don't want to have instances where he's won with tier limits, he's won with cash. I don't want to be sitting here trying to play a player of that level with a deck that they know better than me, if that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. And if... Um... I don't know if you were able to catch the, the last podcast we did a week ago, but uh, Alex and I talked very in depth about making sure your technical play is on point. I mean, <clears throat> you know, we all complain about certain cards. Mine is evenly matched. Yours is droll. Alex is anytime he gets beat. Um, but, <laughs> um, but, you know, we all have those cards that we hate. But sometimes you just can't play around them, right? Sometimes you have to play into Nibiru. You have to make the play that plays around Droll. So it allows you to play around the other nine hand traps in the format. And you just lose because of that. And I don't necessarily think that, you know, you should reflect so harshly on those and reflect more on where you messed up in your technical play because your technical play is going to carry you really far. Um, and I mean, you're a prime example of that. You knew, very, you know, very well about technical play. You know when you're supposed to do something. You when you're testing for an event. I know you like to um, test the same way I kind of do. Whereas you look at like the interactions that that deck does, the end boards, and you see where you can interact best with it. And I think that's um, that level of technical play is where most Yu-Gi-Oh players and most card game players in general are just lacking in. They um, you saw it a lot with Kashira. I don't know how you guys saw it. Um, playing at nationals, but full power Kashira. I'm watching Kashira players just fumble the bag because they're not Trevor, they're not Dominic Couch, they're not. Um, I mean, I forgot the dude who just who won our nationals with it. They're not those people, you know, because they don't know how what to do in a tight spot. They just see, uh, best deck, throw a wallet, top, and it just doesn't work out for them, you know. 
Yeah, and a lot of cases, um, yeah, anybody can watch a YouTube video, and that's why I said the game is different now. Um, I play a lot of events where I, people that, honestly, it's their first event or their first quote-unquote big event, and they do well, and they top in a lot of cases, and they'll tell you, you know, I've only been playing a couple months or what have you. And like I said, I think that's amazing for the game. That should tell new players and people with the brain, come on in, have fun, let's do it. It's a great community. But again, on the side of the competitive perspective, when you're playing against someone and your skill level is clearly above theirs and they get lucky mills because they're on tier or they de-shifter your world and you're playing a graveyard strategy, it is what it is. That's part of the game and you have to be aware of it. But to your point, I think that's where a lot of the testing can circumvent that with your really good technical play. Sometimes there are going to be hands where you can only play into something and you're going to have a blowout, you know, when you're playing tier and you get dwellered, um, you know, when you're playing a drytron strategy and you get drolled i get it things like that happen woohoo suck it up different deck but the big thing is what i've what i've tried to do a lot lately is i know people will joke that i play a lot of cyber strategies and i do but the thing is is i test a lot of things and i'm very lucky i have a lot of good friends that have a lot of strategies and will let me use stuff so over the last couple weeks as an example i've played probably every deck in the meta um i've played an event with it i've tried it i've played multiple things um but what i like to do is i like to see what is going to convince me that this deck is great or what is going to convince me to play something else? And then some days I'll do something completely different. Um, you mentioned Math Mac. I actually did play Math Mac a couple weeks ago at an event. And the only reason I did it is because I had the ability to put an 18 non-engine. So one day I played all hand traps and the next day I played all board breakers. Not because I agreed with either way, but I knew that I would draw them and I would get to see how those cards perform. I hate when people are like, man, I really want to try out this card today. I'm going to put in two of it. Well, guess what? Over the course of a five-round local, you probably never drew it. You didn't get any data. So sometimes winning a local doesn't do anything for you, but getting data will help you for a bigger event. So that's some of the things I like to do to kind of get ready and force myself to test cards that I may or may not think are good, you know? Yeah, I agree. And, that's, <clears throat> and you know, Alex and Tyler can attest to this, but I, that's why I tell everybody, you know, you're press, prepping for a big event. Go to locals. You know, yeah, you're going to play these you're not you're not going to always be playing the best people at your locals you might be playing the dirtles but you also might be playing the dirtles at a ycs you know and you want to know mm -hmm. what to do in those sticky situations because you know those, those decks that we think you know might be the buy like what you're talking about you know with your table 500 deck that gets there because no one's prepared for it you want to be prepared for just the oddities that those kind of decks put you in and well I think it's not even that so much the best advice i've ever been given was actually shout out kobe short um, so Kobe Short used Dueling Book as an example. You don't want to play until you're high rated because that's when you think you're going to get a lot out of the testing. Agree with that. But the opposite of that is true too. And a lot of the times that's what you're talking about with locals. You're going to play people and their strategies might be a little bit off. So that's helpful. But more importantly is they're going to interact in the non-perfect places. When I play against a high level player, I know they're going to ask me in the correct spot. I'm prepared for that. I've already done the mental math. I know it's about to happen. However, when you play a player that is, you know, in some cases a bot and they just beep, boop, beep, boop, and they are just dropping the interactions like crazy. And you're like, no one should ever imprint here, but then they do. So it helps you play in game states like that. And then once you've kind of got a feel for that, then it doesn't matter. Because if you're playing against somebody and you think they're the buy, well, as soon as you get clapped by that person, you'll learn really quick how to do your preparations. In. How do you, uh, when you do get clapped by that beep, boop player, how do you... Uh... How do you compose yourself after that game? You're in a big YCS, so you lost a game against a player that's definitely not better than you um, in those terms. How do you uh, compose yourself to make sure you get on to the next one? So I, I think the biggest thing is, first of all, like staying in the moment right there and realizing that however the scenario transpired, you lost. Get over it. There's nothing you can do about it. The only thing you can do now is if you're still in that game, of course, salvage that. Or if you're on to the next one, that next person is just in your way. So you have to think about it as if you didn't cause yourself the loss there and it was something uncontrollable, they had four hand traps in a starter and you had a hand that couldn't play through that, whatever, it is what it is. What a lot of people forget in this game is it is a freaking card game. There is luck. We shuffle. We draw. Shit happens. So figuring out that there are going to be times that things like that are going to happen. I'm a big math player, so I know 11% of the time driver's going to be in my hand. Welcome to life. I can't get mad about that and wish it was Gamma every time. I know the odds of that happening. But again, to your point, if I let that affect the rest of my gameplay, I can't sit here and say all the practice and all the preparation that I've put in, I'm going to blow because I'm going to let five minutes affect my day. Cannot let that happen. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for these big events. Um, you know, take, you take a fat L 
in a game, you can, it's okay to be upset for a minute, but be upset, pack your stuff away, stand up, and recognize that you have you know how x amount more rounds to play, and focus on the next game. I um, I know when you and I went to Philly, that was actually some of the advice you gave. As I walked up and I was like, man, he he had double evenly. He's like, sometimes they have it. Get ready for the next game. And um, when and I think I told you the same thing when you were about to play, trying to get into day two. Um, I was like, hey, you took that. You know, you took it. Now, you know, let's keep going on. Let's go. And you played against Dragon Link when you were playing Math Mech, which is a terrible matchup, and you ended up winning. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it's all about keeping your mental as composed as possible, I think, too. I, there's just so many nuanced stuff that go in to, like, consistently doing well at tournaments, I feel like, that a lot of people don't always touch on. <clears throat> um, but that's a lot about the state of the game and then some some like nuanced tips on how to be prepared. Do you have any other tips that you like to tell like people who might be going to their first YCS or their game plan is the day two or to top a YCS? What is some advice that you would give to them other than the stuff that we just kind of touched on? So, yeah, I think the biggest thing is make sure that you know your strategy as good as you possibly can. You cannot be playing your strategy and your opponent teaching you moves to it. I've seen so many times where I see a labyrinth mirror or something like that, and they've never practiced the mirror, and their opponent is <laughs> teaching them moves. That is not a good thing to happen when you're at a big event. So the big thing is, of course, know your strategy really well. Um, another thing that I like to say is, like, look at everything you can. Some people have a lot of time. They get to practice. They get to grind on DB. They get to do all these things. Other people don't. So at the end of the day, don't boo-hoo because you don't have the time, effort, and resources that some of the pro players do get over it, go watch some YouTube videos and figure it out. If you have no idea what a deck does, go watch it. Go watch people play. Even if you don't get to play against it, ask questions. I can't tell you how many times I go to a local and either I win or they win, whatever the course of the game, we sit down after the game and we vibe on it. Yo, do you think I could have interacted better here? You know, if you don't mind sharing, what do you think is a big choke point for this deck? And if you do things like that, the cool thing about the community is the community wants people to grow. They want people to have fun and have a good time. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're at a YCS, they're not going to tell you how to straight up clap their deck. But I'm talking about before things like that, you can do stuff like that. And not only are you going to build a relationship with people and get them to be like, yo, this person's willing to help me. But more importantly, you're going to get to ask some nitty gritty questions. Like, you know, you can analyze a game state and say, well, if I would have, what could have happened? And I will say, if people will just take the time and kind of choke back their pride a little bit, then go 03 at a local all day, but learn something from it, you know? Yeah, for sure. Just the, <clears throat> the testing aspect and the... Um, staying humble enough to want to ask your opponent um, how you can get better um, is something I feel like is invaluable. You know, it's okay. You know, you lose, even if it's a bad loss, you just be like, hey, you think there's anything that I might have been able to do differently? And uh, <clears throat> just from a psychological point of view, your opponent's going to want to tell you because, you know, they want to feel good, like they knew where you should have stopped them at and you didn't do it. So it makes them feel good, but you also take that learning experience away. Very much so. So, um, Alex, before we move on, do you have anything you want to add on how you think um, you're, or how you're planning on going about topping this YCS? I know we don't, you don't got a oh. top yet, but I know you're planning on it. Hopefully for this weekend or next weekend. What's my goal, my, my goal is absolutely uh, to top. I've been, uh, you know, you hear a lot of the pros. They say that they build their, you know, strategy to win, not to top. I'm, I'm doing the opposite because you know. That's a that's an area I haven't been at. Uh, a lot of what I've been doing, honestly, is <clears throat> obviously you got your play testing. You know, play testing the meta, testing the new cards, seeing how the new top decks are going to do. Like that, that's all the obvious things. Uh, but a lot of what I've actually been doing is, uh, as you personally know, uh, we talk about this a lot. Is I've been focusing on things outside of Yu-Gi-Oh, like the other aspects of like a tournament experience. Uh, tournament fatigue is a real thing. Uh, so something I've been doing a lot lately has been like running. Um, and what I've noticed, even, uh, you know, at the last case tournament that I went to my energy levels throughout the entire tournament was higher than what it would have normally been in that situation before. So I've been focusing a lot on other aspects of my playing besides just the actual physical playing, because I feel like that's just a given. Uh, but you know, I'm trying to prepare a strategy of like what the right meals for the day are, uh, what the right breaks are for the day. Um, and just making sure that when I go to, this YCS, yes, I am my I am at my absolute like peak ability to play, and not having any factors that can hinder me from performing my best. 
Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> um, for those that don't know at home, Alex and I are doing a 5K together coming up in December. Um, I, I don't know how I ended up convincing you to do that with me. Um, I think it's I something said... something I've been wanting to do. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned it, and I was like, hey, well, I'm running this marathon. You want to do a half marathon? And you were like, eh, no. And I was like, well, they have a 5K the day before. And you're like, that sounds more my speed. So super proud of you for sticking with that. And uh, definitely just like keeping up that, you know, being in a good healthy shape to keep up the mental fatigue or keep the mental fatigue off of you while you're doing the tournament is um, huge. And that plays into the mental game we we're just talking about as well as having some snacks. That's a key point. A lot of people don't, don't think about um, for you guys that don't know if you guys ever need a snack on the pop one team at our YCS or Nationals, I'm going to Murphy. Because I know what he's got in his bag. He's got some got crackers. Bag, man. <laughs> we know we are going to register. We are going to get snacks. And we are going to be ready for the next day. If you don't have a bottle of water and some snacks in the bag, you ain't never played a YCS. That's yeah. all I'm saying. <laughs> the Friday before it's... YCS, uh, or at the Friday before Nationals, we all went. First thing we did, we get checked into the place. All right, we're good. Second thing we did, before we even got f no no we got food first we went and got food third thing got snacks from target to make sure we were good to go <laughs> the scary thing cuz you know we're coming we're coming at a weird time with everything uh YCS Vegas which was my first YCS that was uh during peak covid and like that was worst case scenario as far as all that goes you know they had no ven vendors like anything um the closest like food truck was probably a mile walk away um and, you know, that's kind of like got the fear in me because you don't know what these venues are going to have when you get there. You know, like Los Angeles was amazing because they had the hot dogs right outside. So it was easy to get food in between. But you don't know what to expect coming into this. So you really do need to come prepared. One of my favorite um, prepared snacks to get is a Lunchable. But if I see they have vendors there, I'm just going to toss in the trash can. But always making sure you have something that's key. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> If I was going to this YCS, things that I would make sure in my bag. One, I've got some fruit snacks. Two, I've got mm -hmm. like a, some protein bars to get that protein in me. And three, I'm going to make sure that I've got water, but I'm also going to make sure I have some form of an electrolyte drink. Maybe a powder. Maybe I've got a Gatorade. Um, Gatorade just came out with their new, like, it's like a Pedialyte type drink. Oh my God, that thing is out of this world. Delicious. And it keeps me Bro, hydrated. We are not sponsored by Gatorade. Not happening. Water. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna shit out liquid IV that Danny turned me on. That that, that stuff. I bought me. I bought me a flavor I actually like today. I got strawberry. That stuff's incredible. Yeah, it's it's good stuff. I'm telling you. Um, but you you just want the last thing you want at the YCS or at any big event is for your brain to get tired or for you to get tired. You wanna you wanna stay ready. You know you wanna you wanna be ready to pound it out. Keep keep going. Keep destroying your opponents and uh, do the best you can. And you definitely don't want that to be something on your mind. You're so literally there from 9 a.m. to potentially midnight. Yeah. For those that have never been to a YCS before, it is a long, long day. Like, um, unless you scrub out, you know, going one and three, like a certain somebody in this podcast, <laughs> me, um, <laughs> your, your, your YCS day is going to be a long time. Um, Michael, what time did we end up walking out of Philly? Cause I know I was there with you making sure that you were good. What? Like nine? Oh, that was that was an easier day. We didn't have as many rounds, so yeah, we were done at like nine or ten. I would say like I've had worst case where I've been there till eleven or twelve, and then yeah, it's usually usually between that eight and ten. You know, you're pretty much playing Yu-Gi-Oh ten to twelve hours that day. Yeah, and yeah, Los Angeles, we walked out at twelve thirty. I remember that very vividly. <laughs> and something to make sure is too is you you get a you get a good hearty breakfast in you. Don't eat nothing too greasy because the last thing you want. One, there's never enough bathrooms for a YCS. You don't want to be in that line when the round's about to get called. Uh, flashback 2013 or 2014 YCS Atlanta. I'm undefeated going or about to get ready to go into day two. And I sit across, and my opponent is Blair Hunter. Um, but I'm in the restroom, so I get a game one loss. <laughs> it's, that is not something you want to ever happen. It is... It is not fortunate. It sucks. You feel really crappy, pun intended. Um, so you just want a good, hearty, healthy breakfast going into the end of the day. Because that might honestly be the only like full meal you get that whole day. You're not so wrong. Vegas was a Vegas was a three v three. Me and Mike were on a team, and so was Jay, another player on the team. And I can't remember if it was around like 
I think it was like round three. Um, I had to pee so bad, and I don't I don't remember why, but that round was taking like a while to kick off. So I'm like, am I allowed to run to the bathroom real quick? And they're like, no, you can't run to the bathroom. So I'm like suffering, and I beat my opponent uh, 2-0. Luckily, at around the 25 minute mark, I'm like, okay. Guys, to confirm, I won my game. I have to run to the bathroom. I know I can't come back. It is what it is. Like you just have to be prepared for all of those oh, worst no, case scenarios. No, no, no. Things you hear at a three v three YCS. Yo, I got mine. <laughs> Murphy, you're good. I'm gonna go to the bathroom. Tell me how you won when I get back. Appreciate it, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, that's so, confident. Yeah. No joke though. I've never lost a duel where I've had to pee so badly it almost hurt. Like. That is the most motivated you'll ever catch me at. And that's across any game. Anytime I've had to pee like out of my mind, I win that game in like 20 or 30 minutes because I'm like, I got I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, I had to I had to play around skill drain that game and that was awful. <laughs> well, we talked I, about- I do remember all of the skill being drained out of that game. From oh. both sides that I watched, but yeah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> so that's our take on what you guys should be prepared for to go into um, top in a YCS. Now we're going to change gears a little bit, but st- we're going to stay in the same car, stay in the same lane. We're going to talk about YCS Indy specifically. Um, yeah. This is a place that I don't get to talk on as much because I am not going. I'll talk at the end if they miss anything that I think, you know, maybe you guys should think about. But Alex and Michael, what do y'all think or what are y'all thinking about for this YCS? What decks you preparing for? Are there, are there any kind of um like techs you think people just aren't on the radar for? Are there any decks you think people are kind of sleeping on? Um, you know, of course, Guardian Chimera, because it's the best deck in the game. Don't worry about it, boys. But like, what do you, what do you guys think about going into YCS Indy? What are you afraid of? So I'll go, I'll go first. Um, my game plan, I've talked to Michael, a bunch of other players about this. Um I think the most important thing you could do for this YCS specifically, uh, because there are about nine or ten decks that are viable to play that are all meta, is to just have a incredibly clean list with an incredibly clean side deck. I think if you're trying to go into this event being spicy and finding like the spicy tech, I think you're gonna lose this one. Um, you know, whenever there's like one or two best decks, having that spicy tech is really good. But for an event like this, I really do believe just having like a clean list that covers, you know, across the board is kind of the best way to do it. How I've been looking at my side deck in particular without going to too much uh, specifics is I have cards for the top four decks being Unchained, Rescue Ace, uh, Tier Lewis and Pearly. And then I have cards that cover all of the Tier 2 1.5 slash Rogue decks, uh, the Flu, the Flanderies, the Guardian Chimera, no offense, um, the Manadiums, you know, decks like that. And what I really think is just the best course of action for this event. And Michael, tell me if you have any different thoughts is just having an incredibly clean, 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 clean earlier, be absolutely perfect with your deck and playing it to the best of your ability. Yeah, I think definitely good points on that. Um, this event is different. Um, so it really depends on when a set drops and if the set is going to be impactful. I've played a lot of events where, um, I mean, I played Tirashizu and the Shizu card just got dropped and you had to pick them up before, you know, Vistuals, same thing, yada, yada, yada. And unfortunately, this is one of those YCSs where it's going to be like that. So don't know how many people we're going to have, um, but you're going to have half of the room that just is not prepared for Agov. They, you know, either don't have access to it, don't have the time, all that jazz. And unfortunately, I'm sorry, those people are just going to be the ones that are at the bottom of the barrel. Um, Agov is one of those metal warping sets and it sucks the time it's dropping. It's literally dropping right before. So there are going to be players that are sponsored, players that have shops, players that are professional. that are going to have a leg up. They've been testing these cards for months. Um, they have access to everything. And unfortunately they're just going to be a leg up from that perspective. But again, boo hoo. So you have things you can do to mitigate that in the beginning. And like you said, it's, what are we watching? What are we theorying? What are we talking about in our groups? Because again, there's going to be another group of people that have never read Little Night in that room, and they're going to get punished very heavily. So really, this is a tough event to prepare for. Like Alex said, you want to have a really clean list. You want to have some fairly generic answers. But you also have to remember that you know, you're going to have different layers of interaction that you haven't messed with before. You're going to have some of the tier limit players on the horse card, some of them not. Um, you're going to have some of the Rescue Ace players that have already got the DFL Star stuff and some of them that haven't. So there's just different things there, and you're going to have to learn very quickly, you know, what your opponent is and isn't on. But that's what makes the game so tough, too. You've got a deck like Tier Limits as an example, and there are three, you know, known variants that I see popular all the time. 
And it's very tough because you interact with each of them in a different way. So it's really understanding what do you plan to play against and how do you build accordingly? Um, I'm really big on, you know, the statistic part of it. So if I know I've got 12 rounds, I'm figuring, you know, hey, these are the decks that I think are the big four decks. Here's the decks, the next five or six. But again, the ones that I think are big, I'm planning on playing two to three of those. The others, I'm only planning on playing once. So, you know, if I plan on playing, you know, triple, double or triple the tier, then I am a Flawanderies. I've got to understand that I need to side or main a little bit heavier for that. And if I have to take that one random L against the flu, it is what it is. So those are just some of the things that you want to think about, because at the end of the day, in a big wide format like this, it's very tough to have silver bullets. So like Alex said, you really want to have generic cards and kind of understand where your cards have overlap. Yeah, that's because you really this is going to be one of those few times, you know, and YCS has passed like, OK, I'm going to see Cashier, I'm going to see Cashier, I might see Labyrinth, I might see, you know, um, just like a couple other decks. This is really the first YCS in a long time where your opponent could be on so many different decks and genuinely be caught off guard if you're not prepared for absolutely everything in the room, at least to some extent. And to put it in perspective for players that just haven't been around for a long time, so I'm thinking back to you know those earlier days like we talked about when I used to compete a lot. Um, the last couple of YCSs I've been to, uh, heavy, heavy cash through mat at full power. I played half cash that day, so it was like six rounds of cash, and the rest was you know one or two other things, some sprite, what have you. And then I fast forward to these last couple events we played, and you're playing a different deck every single round. And then I think back to the 2009, 2010 days, I have had 10 and 11 round events where I have played the same deck every single time. And it's not because it's a tier zero format. It's because, you know, there are a couple good decks, but once you get past the first few rounds and you're at the top tables, that's all you're playing all day. So back then, like I said, it was much, much easier to deck build and you knew what you were going to play against. Whereas now, I mean, literally, I can be in the top tables and I can play Pearly Run Round and I can play Tier Limits the next. Completely different strategies, you know, so... And like you said, too, you know, there's different variants of all these decks. You, you know, you might not see some of the tech cards that the opponent plays game one and the game two. You get caught off guard because you decided one thing, which is something different because you didn't understand, like, what variant of the deck they're playing. Just a really, it's frustrating, but kind of fun at the same time. You know, it's, it's frustrating that you can't really be prepared for it, but it's fun because there's so many different decks that just so many different people can play. Yeah, and this is, I mean, this is a little bit, a little bit off subject, but I mean, I um, just recently I played a, a big in-person Edison event that they had down in Orlando, and doing very well, um, undefeated for many, many rounds, and then just exactly what Alex talked about, tech cards. I played against something, and I only saw part of their strategy, so I sided accordingly, and then I got mollywopped by things that I did not see in game one. That happens in current all the time. So it's being mm-hmm. aware of uh, Vanquish Soul is probably one of the big, well, Vanquish Soul is very popular with it now, but Tear is probably one of the other ones. I hate to keep bringing that up, but it's just very popular. Whereas we see the deck, we see the layers, we see what it's doing, and then they randomly flip a Tikbu on you. And you're like, well, are they randomly put up the zombie world against the flu players? So those are the things that people have to understand the format now. It's not about just set back row, just build a board, yada, yada. It's about multi layers of interaction. What does my front row do? What does my back row do? What does my graveyard do? What does my hand do? The decks that are most successful have multiple layers of interruption. And when you have things like that, that's how you keep your opponent off guard. Yeah, there's um, definitely a lot to think about going into this. And what circling back to what Alex said, I think this is a event that comes down to having a solid deck list having a solid having your technical play be sound you know you don't want to be sitting down and having a stupid mistake because you didn't understand an interaction a ruling or what something that your opponent's playing Um, i think there is less spice right now precisely for what michael was talking about the format is wide open it's not as streamlined as sometimes it is and i think you just want your side deck and your main deck to have the most generically good cards as you possibly can um, stuff you know you want to be able to flex really well you don't want to be caught off guard like if there if you play against labyrinth you know and you never pre- prepped for labyrinth you you don't want to be sitting there taking the l you want to at least have like something in the main board something in the sideboard that can take care of them you know but i think a lot and i love don't get me wrong i love some spicy tech cards but i think cards like um uh like a specific card not 
Like, I guess D-Barrier would be one. Like, D-Barrier might not be the best call unless you just think tier is going to be that represented. You need cards that are going to, like, be good into tier and good into um, Unchained or be good into tier and be good into X deck. You, you need them to be very wide. D -shirt, or D-Barrier might be, like, a little bit of a, you know, a controversial one, but just cards like that, you need them to be wide, not super specific. I think, uh, I think a card that might work for your reference there is, like, Gravekeeper's Inscription. A lot of people talk about that card, and it's one of those cards where it's a silver bullet into some, but you have to make sure that it has some form of overlap into other matches. So those are some of the things, you you know, as an example of what you're talking about. I actually was just about to use why I think Grave Creepers Inscription is good right now. Um, I think right now there's you shouldn't be having as many going first cards. There's not a whole lot of reason to, I, I fully believe right now. Um because most decks, when they go off, they go off. You want cards to answer your opponent's strategy when you're going second, or, you know, some backup cards for when you're going first as well. And I think Gravekeeper's Inscription is one of those that covers the two most popular decks I feel like right now, that being Tier <laughs> Laments and uh, Unchained, because you just say cards can activate in the graveyard, and you look at your opponent and you go, your turn, buddy, and uh, they don't do anything on their turn one. So... Yeah, some of the some of the really popular tech choices I've seen. Again, I'm very fortunate that I travel a lot, so I get to play a lot of different places. I get to see a lot of crazy things. Um, I got hit with multiple spell bounds last weekend. It's a very interesting <laughs> card. Um, I, and honestly, like I know people are joking about it here and there. It's bad. Please don't play it, guys. It's funny. I mean, it was cool when it when it resolved, but I mean, you know, the match list still got signed how it did. So sorry about that. Um, but some of the other some of the other fun things I've seen I've seen a lot of people on deck lockdown for the decks that can play it very interesting card does a lot of good things um, I've seen some mistake and arrest here and there so that's been another interesting one um, but again it's it's just figuring out what works best for your strategy I've seen a lot of people talking about Phantasme Phantasme is great that's awesome but you have to be aware that not every strategy can play it so you have to think through that um, whereas an example if you're playing Dragon Link and you're not playing it I think you're an idiot so you know. Yeah, and that's another yeah, thing, too, is um, you want to prepare for what your deck is weak against, you know? If your deck auto-blows out purely, do you really need to side Xyz Encore? Um, if you're, you know, if you're maining 62 books, like, is Xyz Encore a card you need? Whereas if you lose to purely, maybe Xyz Encore is a card you play. Maybe, um, if you like you said, D-Link, if you lose to Unchained, maybe Phantasmy is a card you play. And a lot of that, you know... you. You shouldn't be looking at a Guardian Chimera list and taking their side deck when you're about to take Unchained into a, a big event. Is kind of what yep. I'm trying to say. That's a great way to look at it. I say unless you're signing for a low. You should not single 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 um, targets like one matchup, right? Like you should have a car that if you if you are primarily using it for one matchup, it needs to have application into another matchup. Um, if, if you're looking at your side deck right now in preparation for any, you look at any card on your side deck, you need to ask yourself, what decks does this hit? And if it doesn't hit more than one deck, I don't think it should be in your side deck for this, for this event. Yeah. General rule of thumb for people that are, that are newer and getting used to building more competitive lists. If you're thinking about a card in your side, in your main deck, you want it to be able to hit at least four of the decks you think you're going to potentially play against. Cause again, it's going to have overlap in multiple matches. But then when you think about a side deck card, Alex says it a little bit better. The side deck card can be a little bit more specific to one or two. But if it's going to be just for one match only, XC's Encore is probably a great example of that card. You have to either not have enough cards for that, or you have just been hurt so much that you have to have that silver bullet. And for those of us that have had our pearly player open delicious every freaking game, I get it. I understand why you want to play three of it in your side. Yeah. XYZ Encore in particular is also like just a great car to front chain because going second, there's no reason not to side in against almost any deck. If if your opponent can make Dweller or even the Mirror for the Caesar, you should probably play that card, honestly. Oh, you're you're talking about if you are an unchained player yourself, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that's <laughs> yep. tracking. It, it does deal with the Abyss Dweller. So those are things like that, Alex, that the, you're gonna have to understand how do you interact with things like that. But so unfortunately, yep. like we talked about for Agov, so that's the thing that we, the format that we're in today is not the Agov format. So understanding that it's going to completely change and boards are going to have Little Knight on them now. And for people that don't understand the implications of that, I'm sorry, you're going to have to read more. But it's really getting people to understand that 
you're having to deck build for things that you're not currently seeing today. Because unless you're testing online, you're not seeing that. So again, it's just, that's the hardest thing for Indy. I think Richmond is going to be a much cleaner event just from a solved format perspective. God, I wish I was going to Richmond. If you're like us and you're preparing for post, um, for post AI, if you have a leg up on majority of the room, and I and I really think that, you know, if you haven't done it yet, start now. Like read SP Little Knight. That's going to be in every deck you play. Up, uh, just just be prepared. Like there's a lot of weird interaction that that card in particular can have. And for those of you at home that you know, you might be sitting in a place that a lot of us have sat in before, which is maybe you can't afford the new stuff when it comes out. I like, you know, that's a reason to not have these cards, but if you're going to a YCS or even a regionals, there is absolutely zero excuse, none for you to not have ever laid your eyes on those cards before. If your opponent places SP little Knight on the board, I mean, it's fine to read it. If you want to make sure that like you, you, you know, you know exactly what it does, with, but you should have a general idea of what that hell that card does. If they're playing SP Knight and you're like, oh, I've never seen this card before, you're probably the buy. I'm just yeah, gonna... just because you're just because you don't own a card or you don't plan on picking up a card because of price doesn't mean you should be ignorant to what it does. Um, and then also just kind of understanding that, you know, people are going to use cards in creative ways. So, you know, again, reading the card and making sure you really understand. My big hot take on that card is this time next year, I think that card is banned. It is um, it, it is good. It gives me uh, Hobby Fibrax vibes. I don't know what it is about Link Twos in the game, but uh, but yeah, that card is uh, that card is deceptively strong. It's literally a better DPE, but you don't have to play Bricks in the deck. It's insane. the thing. The thing that even makes it better than DPE is not only is it an offensive card, but it is a fantastic defensive card. It allows yep. you to to dodge so many things. And hell, I've seen multiple scenarios where people are using it to clear your own board to dodge things. Um, you know, that way your your board is completely free, opens you up to use like the di- the dead lightning storm in your hand. There are just so many technical applications that players that understand how to utilize that card correctly will get rewarded. So if you're listening, imagine you're signing evenly, which really is not a great card right now. Your opponent has an False. SP Knight and some other card field. You go, you go battle phase, activate evenly. Your opponent can chain the SP Knight, banish their SP Knight and their monster in field, and they have one set card. You banish nothing. You get no value off that evenly match. Um, your opponent loses no card advantage, and they still have their set card. Like SP Little Knight is an insane card. Hear me out. Hear me out. I'm a firm Listen. believer. That if I'm evenly matched and I'm making you trigger effects, evenly matched is getting my value. Like, <laughs> especially now that I'm playing Runix with my Chimera deck, I don't mind leaking the spice of what I'm playing because I ain't going to this YCS. But uh, I'm a, I'm using it turn zero or my turn one, and then <laughs> I ain't using that card again. So if I just get you to activate your card effects, that's like I played into. Oh man, I forgot his name. He's at his, our locals. He's another unchained player. It's not Michael, but um, he the dude only had three cards on the field, and I was like, yeah, evenly matched. And he was like, okay, and he like flipped up his trap. He set some stuff up, and I was like, yep, now you don't have that. Da 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 die. I just man, I maybe it's my bias towards evenly matched. You know, Michael has seen on the doll where it has hurt me at YCSs, and Alex and Michael have seen where it hurt me at Nats, but uh. I think that card is insane currently. The card does have its applications. I don't know how I feel about it in a wide format, but it does have its applications. Yeah. Uh, I just like it because no one ends on an Omni Negate other than a Monadium, and if they made their full board, I'm just scooping anyway. So. <clears throat> I do like that about this format, though, like, or how the game has evolved. It's uh, oh My God, you end you know, on two... Back in the day. Two summon negates. What do you mean? That's easy to out. <laughs> point is, also, point is, you, you rescue aces ending on omni negates. Just throwing that out there, bud. What's that? I said rescue aces ending on omni negates. Just throwing that out there, bud. That's but the thing is, that's like that's really not the best build though, because it requires you to see both your engines. I actually tested that. 
um, a lot like what you said earlier, you know, preparing for this event, I actually played Rescue Ace online to see, you know, what its weaknesses are, like how to kind of play it. And what I found was playing the Jet Synchron was a brick. Like, yeah, you can special summon it from the deck with a new day of Blessed Star engine, and you can make a Barone and a, and a Borderload Savage, which is great. But if you don't have access to your Rescue Ace engine on top of that, then it's just a, if you draw, and if you draw, it's just a dead card. It does nothing. It does nothing turn my, one. And it takes up two feed, bases in your extra deck. My feedback to those deck builders is if you have accomplished what you just said and didn't see your Rescue Ace engine in your Rescue Ace deck, Shame on you for bad deck building. Maybe you're right. I mean, I only played it for one day, so I can't comment on that too much. And I built a deck pretty fast. But irreg irregardless, it's just... Yeah, Rescue Ace is about to be... Um, the best deck. Yeah, I think it's about to dominate this YCS. People especially just... with FP. Especially with SP Knight, because... Oh, I don't even care about SP Knight. Night. I care about the... What's the new thing that searches out the level one fire? Is that that's out for this? Yeah, we, we care about that, but we care about SP as well. So to y'all's point, until probably a month ago, when we really started digging into Agob text and what they were going to look like, um, Rescue Ace is still in the top four for me. It was great, but I am I am deathly scared of that deck for Indie guys. I think I think that is the deck that the good players will be on. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, it's uh. It's it's nutty. It is nutty, that's for sure. But, well, that wraps it up pretty much for what I was thinking about for Indy. Does anyone have any things they want to close us out with? Anything they think our viewers should be watching out for for Indy? Or um, you guys think we're good to go on it? Not really Not really so much for Indy. Um, you, you know, like, I guess the last thing I want to talk about, like with these things, is just enjoy the trip. You know, uh, a lot of times for these YCSs, you're you're traveling for it. Have fun in these cities. A lot of YCSs are in really cool cities or places you would never expect to go. Like I never thought in my life I'd be going to Indianapolis, Indiana, but here I am. I'm going in a few days, and really, just whenever you travel to these YCSs, just enjoy the experience because there's more to Yu-Gi-Oh than just Yu-Gi-Oh, and that's kind of like the biggest takeaway from all of this. Yeah, and I think my thing, too, is um, as you see us at events, you know, we aren't Pac, we aren't Jesse. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we're people that love the game. We love the community. We're better than Pile of Bricks. So hit us up, man. If you want to know anything about the game, vibe on something, need help on something, uh, just hit us up, man. I mean, at the end of the day, that's the best thing about the nerd community. Everybody's there. Uh, you know, you want to build. You want to do good things. Um, so, yeah, hit us up, man, if anybody needs anything. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's been Michael, Alex, and Danny with the Pop One Podcast signing off. Thank you guys so much for listening. Check out our first episode if you didn't check it out. And stay tuned. We'll be back after YCS Indianapolis. Definitely with Alex. We'll see if Michael can carve out some time sometime soon to just kind of give us a recap on, you know, if our predictions were right, if they were wrong, uh, and the way forward. Thanks so much for watching, guys.